So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, friends, depending upon which part of the world you are joining us from. Uh, this is Dr. Vijay Agarwal. I'm the president of CAHO. And it is my proud privilege to once again welcome you to this ninth episode of the international webinar series, which we, we very proudly we host it along with ISQA. And for the session today, I have the pleasure to introduce a long time friend of ours, uh, Madam Upasana Arora. Madam Upasana Arora is a dynamic leader in our healthcare industry. And let her young looks not deceive you. She has been managing and the director of the Yashoda hospitals now for more than 21 years. She was the first first uh, person, I think, from India to have received the prestigious ISQA of the, again, a very prestigious organization that is the SCPC uh, in healthcare sector. She's the chairperson of the Indo-US Chamber of Commerce. She's the co-chairperson in SOCHAM for their healthcare council, for empowerment council, and for the women forum. She is a member on the NABL board. She is a member of the accreditation committee of NABH, and she is the FICI committee member on medical tourism and health services committee. So, to welcome Dr. Charles Vincent, the star speaker of the day, I invite uh, Mrs. Upasna Arora to do the honors, please. Over to you, Madam Arora. Thank you, sir. Good evening from India to everyone, our attendee, our organizer, and uh, my dear guest, Dr. Vincent. So what is most important thing in healthcare when we talk about hospital? The most important thing is patient safety, because if patient is safe in a hospital, then his recovery is fast, his satisfaction level is very high. So that patient is a star ambassador for that hospital, as well as when we talk about our quality indicators, then it will be very good. And uh, everything will be fine in a hospital if patient is safe. So today's guest speaker or a star speaker, I should say, Dr. Charles Vincent, who has dedicated his life for uh, as a researcher or he worked for patient safety. So let me introduce him. Dr. Charles Vincent, who is MPhil and PhD, who is Emeritus Professor of Psychology, University of Oxford. Charles Vincent trained as a clinical psychologist and worked in the British NHS for several years. Since 1985, he has carried out research on the cause of harm to patients, the consequences for patient and staff and methods of improving the safety of healthcare. He established the clinical risk unit at University College in 1995 where he was professor of psychology before moving to the Department of Surgery and Cancer at Imperial College in 2002. He is the editor of Clinical Risk Management, BMJ publication, second edition, 2001, author of Patient Safety, second edition, 2010, and author of many papers on medical error, risk, and patient safety. With Reen Amelberti, he published Safe, Safer Healthcare, Strategies for the Real World Springer Open Assess 2016. From 1999 to 2003, he was a commissioner on the UK Commission for Health Improvement and has advised on patient safety in many inquiries and committees, including the recent Berwick Review. In 2007, he was appointed director of the National Institute of Health Research Center for Patient Safety and Service Quality at Imperial College Healthcare Trust. He is a fellow of the Academy of Social Science and was recently reappointed as a National Institute of Health Research Senior Investigator. In 2014, he took up a new, mo new post as Health Foundation profes Professional Fellow in the Department of Psychology, University of Oxford, where he continues his work on safety in healthcare and led the Oxford Region NHS Patient Safety Collaborative and was Director of Oxford Healthcare Improvement. So you can see he has dedicated his whole life for patient safety. So now I welcome Dr. Charles Vincent, kindly join us and enlighten us with your speech. Thank you. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for the warm welcome. And uh, it's lovely to be involved and in India. I remember very fondly various trips to India and looking at healthcare systems. So what I've decided to talk about is how to perhaps put all these different ideas together and how to create um, a systemic approach to managing risk and to safety that I hope is usable in many different settings. And um, I'm going to link this with the talk of Professor Amal Berti, René Amal Berti, who you heard earlier. And I'm also going to acknowledge my colleague, Mike English, who's a professor in tropical medicine. And you'll see why this is important in a minute. So what I'm going to try and do is uh, call the talk a portfolio approach. And you'll see a portfolio, a group of interventions. How can you mix and match them? And I'm going to explain a little of the background of this in a minute and talking about how care varies how safety is, you look at safety in different contexts and what it means to, to think about a portfolio. And I'm going to discuss this in systems like the UK and also show you about some writing I've done with Mike English in Kenya, which I think will be more applicable to perhaps some of the poorer systems that some people work in. I mean, all of our systems are under pressure in different ways, but obviously some much more than others. Okay. So this is a slide from um, René Amorberti's talk to CAHO a few weeks ago. And I don't worry if you didn't see this um, talk because we'll, I'll go back to this. But you'll see René finished right at the end of his talk by discussing this approach to um, having a whole repertoire, a portfolio of interventions on what this might mean. But he didn't discuss it in detail. He showed the need for it because of the way our healthcare systems are changing and the challenges we face. But I'm going to now link that. So if you did see this, you'll see, find this talk is a sort of follow on from René's. So I'm going to go back to how we develop these ideas and to this book, Safer Healthcare, which is you can Google and it's a download and you can download it for free. So, um, and access any of the things I'm saying for the next little bit of the slide. And we were concerned that to think about safety in very different settings, which I'll explain in a minute. And we also believed that we were not using a wide enough range of strategies. Seems to me us that the strategies we're using were largely quality improvement and we needed to, that was fine, but we needed to think more broadly. And also how are we gonna keep care safe, say in people's homes, almost all our work's been done in the hospital. So there were many things to think about in terms of what we should do. Now, before I come to um, talking about the approach to interventions and the portfolio, I just want to introduce a couple of ideas to you. You might think of safety as really about errors and about incidents, <clears throat> but perhaps it's more true to say that it's about how care, the standard of care varies a great deal. So here are some studies showing just how common problems are. This is, these are from Britain. So this is some two reviews where they looked at, you know, found that maybe 20% of patients didn't have satisfactory care uh, or outpatient appointments happen without information, important information missing. This is in the UK. And this is very, very common to many countries. So we very seldom get care. This is exactly what we want. And people work in very difficult conditions. We did a study in Britain that found that almost 20% of operations started without the right equipment. And they're always looking around for equipment. So we're constantly under pressure and not, and not seeing the care that we really want necessarily. <clears throat> so from the book, book, there's a diagram here, which envisaged five levels of care. There's nothing special about the five levels. But the care envisaged by standards, what is what written down, what our regulators want, is at the top. And down at the bottom is the sort of unsafe care, which is dangerous. But a lot of care happens in the middle where things go pretty well, but there are minor problems all the time. And those of you who work as clinicians know that just in one afternoon, you can be in the operating theater, for instance, and everything is going fine. But then there are equipment problems and perhaps somebody is called away or there is an interruption. And quite quickly, the standard of care is not as good as it was. So care moves all the time. And this suggests to us we have to be alert to the 
the risks that happen moment by moment and day to day, as well as the sort of trying to make longer term improvements. Now, the second idea I want to give you is about how safety is achieved in different contexts. <clears throat> so let's think about this. In Britain, we are often encouraged to think about aviation or nuclear power, um, maybe in your countries too. Um, sometimes people say, why can't healthcare be like aviation? And of course it is, commercial aviation is fantastically safe, but we should think about the approach they take to this. Um, they exclude risk as fast as possible. <clears throat> if they can avoid taking, if, if there's bad weather, they may, you may not take off. They have a lot of procedures, very strong regulation, and the system is quite insulated from other pressures in many ways. And you can avoid a lot of risk in these settings. <clears throat> Another approach would be um, firefighting. Now I'm not, I don't know about firefighting myself. I'm just giving you this as an image. This is an area where people have to embrace risk. They have to think about risk. Obviously that's the nature of the business, but it can be managed and controlled to some extent. And the way they achieve safety is partly through procedures and having routines, but a lot of it is flexible teamwork and flexible routines and just ways of learning about common hazardous situations. <clears throat> and a lot of the healthcare is much more like this than it's like aviation, I think. And we also can have very um, ultra adaptive um, approaches as what Rene and I call them. He has studied deep sea fishing and um, the uh, approach here, this is a very hazardous situation. Working conditions are very unstable and really everything is reliant on individual um, expertise, individual resilience and every individual people doing the best they can. Of course, they all want to be safe, but they can't rely on the usual sort of procedures and so on that we might in other settings. <clears throat> so people want to be safe in all of these settings, but they have to do it in a very different ways in different places. And in healthcare, I won't go to this slide in detail, <clears throat> but you can see we have ultra safe systems. We have pharmacy, we have radiotherapy, have blood transfusion, where it's very like aviation in lots of ways, but much of it like elective surgery and a lot of psychological and psychiatric treatment is more like team um, firefighting, that sort of model. And then we have occasionally very hazardous situations, dangerous outbreaks of infection, very unexpected things, which are much more ultra adaptive. So we have to ask ourselves as well, which situation we're in, where we would like to be, whether we can think we can move into a, a more standardized approach and what kind of strategies might be appropriate in these different settings. So just keep those ideas in mind and we'll come on and think about the actual strategies themselves. <clears throat> now we have a family of strategies. Obviously just to list 40 strategies, it's not very helpful, but as I'll try and show you later in the talk, we can think of these in five very broad categories. And I find this, and Rene, I think this very helpful in trying to think what kind of approaches and what kind of combination of approaches and I'm gonna use in this particular setting. If I'm a surgeon or a nurse running a ward, or I'm a primary care doctor, or I'm thinking about the home, or even if you're running a, a playground for children, you can still think about these broad five approaches. And the first two we call really about trying to make the system as best as possible. This is a really a more of a quality improvement approach or human factors and ergonomics. You optimize, you make things as good as possible. But the bottom three are much more about when the care is, as I was saying, at the, in the lower levels and we're in dangerous territory and we want to avoid harm more than we want to um, optimize everything. And I, I think to me, these strategies are slightly different and their purpose is slightly different. So let's see what they are, these five categories. And, the, and then we'll see, having done that, we'll look at Kenya and find it in examples of how to actually use them in practice. <clears throat> so the first one, we, safety is best practice, or Rene would call it a spa to standards. 
And a lot of the safety um, approaches we have, and this is from a review by Paul Shekel and others in 2013 that said, well, what safety strategies really work? Where have we got evidence? And there are things like um, hand washing, interventions to reduce infection control, checklists like the World Health Organization Surgical Safety Checklist. But the basic idea is that to, you just try and take a clinical process and you make it as reliable as possible. It's very important. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with this. It's just one approach among others. But almost all the evidence for, that we have in patient safety is of interventions of this kind. Reliability, bundles, that, which are basically trying to do groups of processes reliably and make them, instead of having you know, 80 percent um, reliability, we try and move, if, try and get 100 <clears> percent. <throat> so that's one vision of how to improve safety. Now, another one is not so much to think about the clinical process, but to think about the system as a whole and how to support the people involved. How do we support managers, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, psychologists, anybody who works? So if you are in a high tech and rich system, you can think about automation, decision support, improving in quick design and things like that. But in any system, there are very important things. I see a lot of problems in the UK because nobody is quite clear whose responsibility it is to give a particular drug or to carry out a particular task. And things are forgotten because team roles and responsibilities are not clear. That's a very important way of um, improving the system. <clears throat> Standardization and simplification. Let me give you an example here, which is from the UK. We have a lot of procedures and a lot of regulations. And when I worked in cancer surgery, which I did for 10 years, with a group of young researchers, I said, well, how many procedures are there? You are clinicians. How many procedures you have to follow? And we took um, an elective hip operation and we said, well, how many procedures are there to follow? And in Britain, in the first 24 hours, there were 75 different procedures. So it's crazy. And we used to criticize people for not following procedures when there was an instance or something went wrong. But the system was just unbelievably complicated and impossible for staff to use. So improving the system often is to try and simplify the system. So that's the second approach. <clears throat> now, the third one is very more unusual in healthcare. And although it's, René has worked in many industries and he says it's widely used. Now, if you think about if you go to the airport and you're flying and there's a problem on the plane, they won't take off, they'll just sit there. It's not like us starting our operations without having all the equipment there. They don't take off until they're ready. If there is a big storm or a problem, they will stop the service, you wait. And there are different ways you, and sometimes we place restrictions on individuals or we place restrictions of different kinds. And in all sorts of different ways, we try and avoid risk. It's not the trying to manage things when they've got happening or when things are becoming dangerous. You just say, we won't go there. And I'll give you some more examples later. But here are some quite common examples from Britain. Mostly with drugs. Um, I could give you other examples, but there's not really time to go into it. <clears throat> um, junior doctors in Britain are not um, allowed to prescribe certain drugs. There are controls on drugs and people have to pass tests of competency before they can give certain medications. All of this is about assuring competency, controlling risks. But sometimes you can control this by saying, well, you know, this procedure should not be carried out in an outpatient clinic. It's too dangerous. It should only be carried out in a hospital. So you ask yourself, what are the conditions of safe practice and what controls do we need? So that's one, uh, another approach that we don't think about very much in healthcare. That's the third one. <clears throat> now there's a fourth approach, and this is very much particular to safety. And this is to monitor and detect problems. 
Now, of course, any clinician has to do this all the time to keep on the lookout for this. And experienced professionals in any field are always aware of what could go wrong. In fact, for me, perhaps one of the great marks of experience is not so much that you're more skillful than people younger, but you have a much clearer idea of what can go wrong and perhaps what to do when things go wrong. You're more aware. Rene studied fighter pilots at one time, and you might think we have in healthcare not much in common with fighter pilots, and we don't. But the lesson from this is not that they are supermen or superwomen, but they do a huge amount of thinking about what might go wrong. And they plan it and they build it into their systems, they build it into their preparations. So they don't rely so much on being brilliant people or brilliant improvisers, but on a huge amount of preparation. Now we can think about these things individually, but we can also build them into our systems. So when people introduce briefing before an operation, they gather people together to say, okay, is everybody clear what we're doing? And the WHO surgical safety checklist has this, or you talk afterwards, or you do team training where you check each other or you monitor and you, um, you try and check for errors that are happening. You're taking the approach, you're saying, we know this is a complex system. We know there will be errors. We know things will go wrong. We can't control everything, but what we can do is be good at picking things up when things do go wrong. Again, this is a very, very different approach from checklists and bundles and trying to make things reliable. This is assuming there will be problems and saying what we must do is to find time and find a bit and train people to watch each other, to speak up, to, to monitor these things as they come up. There's a fifth approach, which for me is very, very important, which, which we call mitigation which is after things have gone wrong. We are still, I think, and probably always will have some problems where people need to be looked after. But often in healthcare, when something does go wrong, we then make it worse by not looking after people for whom it's, who have suffered. And I, it's not time to go into this, but this is a huge important, I think, possibly Albert Wu has talked about this in this series. So the most important part of this is that when something has gone wrong, to support the patients, the families, the carers, and to see, to deal with the physical effects, or to deal with any psychological trauma, and also to support the staff. Um, it is generally a very traumatic experience for a member of staff when something goes wrong and a patient is harmed. And so this is a very, very important part of any strategy that one might take. And probably we could do a whole lecture on this. But the, this approach could be taken further. And you can also prepare patients in the same way. Now in hospital, you don't perhaps want to do this so much, but this is a very, very wonderful approach, uh, training program for people who have dialysis at home. Now the training for dialysis in many countries is advanced and people are trained um, to do their own dialysis. And uh, this is great. It gives them a lot of freedom. They don't have to come to the hospital. Or... <clears throat> but in this program, they also made the patients aware of what the hazards were. They explained what to do if you had a problem or if tubes blocked or something went wrong. They gave them explicit strategies. They gave them a letter to the emergency department if they needed to go, if there were problems. So they trained the patients in safety. So this was mitigation of a very sort of advanced order. So that's the five broad approaches. And that's a summary of um, what is explained in much more detail in different settings in the home, in hospital, in the book I've shown you. But more recently, um, I've worked with uh, Mike English, to see how we might apply these ideas and some other more, more well understood approaches <clears throat> into poor settings. We thought, well, a lot of these safety ideas are developed in, um, in Europe or America. And yet where Mike has worked with his colleagues in Kenya, the 
clinical environment and the working environment is very, very different. And there are many um, good international programs, um, but the difficulty often is that they, they don't last very long or they last a few years. And also they sometimes bring in technologies and approaches which are not really suitable to the environment. And Mike and his colleagues think, well, what can a local leader do? What can they do to improve safety and quality? So we thought about, well, what ideas have we got which would help people do this? So let me now try and take this portfolio approach and try and show you um, a little bit about this. I won't, I tell you a little bit about Kenya for those who are in perhaps watching from the UK or somewhere <coughs> or in Europe, um, who may not be so familiar with these environments. As you see, the health spending is very, very low compared with uh, Europe or U USA. There are very few doctors and the people, this heroic um, clinical staff working there have the most unbelievable pressures to cope with. Now Mike's particular um, specialty is um, a neonatal ward. Um, so this is a picture of um, a neonatal unit in Kenya where Mike is working and you see the babies in little um, uh, metal baskets and electric fire warming a young baby. Very, very, very difficult situations. And we know also that in these environments, the mortality for these young babies is very high. They're often very sick um, and they, it's very hard to bring the standard of care one would like. And this is very, very draining and for the staff who suffer a lot from burnout and a lot of great pressures, as do many people around the world in these environments. And it may seem a sort of very difficult task to bring some of these ideas about safety to these kind of environments, particularly as there is no particular safety person. We don't have, I mean, in, even in the UK, we don't really have big departments of quality or safety. We have a few people who may be specialists, but I can tell you the places I've worked at we don't have a lot of skills in these areas. But particularly in Kenya, it's got to be the people on the ground. There are no specialists. It's got to be the local leaders. And this is true, obviously, in many areas of the world. So we try to think, how can we bring something which think approaches which don't necessarily require a lot of money, but will nevertheless make some kind of difference and will make some improvements, make care a little bit safer in these very, very difficult environments. So I'm going to summarize the findings, the ideas of two papers, which again, you're free to download and I'll show you the papers in a minute. Here's the first one. It's called First Do No Harm and uh, we can circulate the papers later if, if, um, if CAHO would like to do this. <coughs> so our questions are, as I said, what do local leaders do? And can we use this sort of safety thinking? And this first paper is about diagnosing your system. And often in quality improvement in the UK, at least, we just pick a single eye thing to approach. People just choose one thing to work on. And it's a strange way of approaching because if you see patients, you make a diagnosis. You think, what are the most important problems? Where do we want to work? What are our strengths? What are our, the problems we are addressing? So this first paper is about that and just some of common approaches that we can use, um, whether we're in Kenya or whether we're in, in England. <clears throat> so one method of uh, um, analysis I, I worked a great deal on about 20 years ago was analyzing incidents and finding structures, ways to do this. And again, we can circulate papers about this. And we, in the paper, we have an example of um, an incident with a young baby. This is a, a fictitious example, but it's a very, very typical, who uh, died in this example from um, hospital-inquired infection. And when you go through an incident, you go through a story and you follow the methods, which I won't outline in any detail now, and you look at all the factors. This is the critical thing that contributed to this. You can pull out 
it gives you what I would call a window on the system. It tells you things about your system. So these are some of the things, the absence of hand rub. This particular problem here was that we think this baby that um, was weighed on scales that weren't clean and they didn't have any procedures for cleaning the scales. There were also problems about the drugs you were given afterwards. Um, the vials of drugs looked similar. They didn't have the proper dilution charts. So looking at these incidents gives you a list of problems that you can begin to address. And as you'll see, most of these are quite, they're difficult to change, but they're not requiring a lot of resource. So incident analysis is one very, very useful approach, which anybody can do and anyone can learn a systematic method of doing it. Another approach is to look at process mapping and actually to draw out what the processes are. And this is a diagram, we won't go through it. There are many examples of this, but this is a diagram from Kenya. And it highlights the fact that it, there is a process. Um, there's a, it's not always understood by everybody working there, but there is a process for delivering drugs and, and dispensing, but it doesn't have enough checks in it. And um, in this particular example, then this particular drug error was repeated on a number of days because there weren't enough checks. Now, there are other things you can do. You can do observations, you can do interviews. There's a lot of different techniques, which we discussed that you can use to do your system diagnosis. But when you've done it, it's possible to draw up a whole list of the strengths and the weaknesses in your particular unit. And the, on the right, you'll see a very a big, big list, a big table, which is in the paper. And obviously you can't see that in detail, but I want you to see the, that there is a great deal of information on it. And on the left, I just pulled out a couple of examples. So you can see, you know, some of the examples here. So it, these are categorized into team, the organization, the staff, and, um, and, and other sort of, and the working environment um, in a cause and sort of classic ergonomic and human factors thinking. So you can see the strengths here. They've got pulse oximetry, they've got smartphones, and the team has already prioritized critical tasks for the, um, that they have to do. But there are some very obvious problems. Um, they, they don't have special drug formulations for children. Um, there are problems with new staff. They don't get induction or training into the unit. And they have very poor um, observation charts, which aren't specially designed. So in this way, you can, a unit or a, t a leader and a group of people can produce an, a safety assessment, if you like, a system diagnosis of what the pros and what's good and what's difficult about where they work. Okay, so that's the first paper is about that. And it sets out in more detail the things one can do. Now, the second paper takes the ideas we were talking about earlier and says, okay, so we have this, these five categories of um, approaches we can take. Can we use these in Kenya? And can, what can local leaders do to improve safety? <clears throat> and I just want to give you a few examples of so sort of things we might do because um, we've just got about five minutes or so left. And it's also particularly important that this reflects local priorities. And the other very important thing about the system diagnosis is it's done by people who work there in that particular environment. The strengths and the problems will be different in different units and different countries. And that's very different from perhaps being part of an international program where the priorities may be set, talking to people with local knowledge, but they may reflect more international aspirations than what's needed on the ground. Anyway, assuming you've done this, you can then think, okay, what's my portfolio going to be? What am I going to kind of prioritize? And this is the example I'm just giving you from Kenya. <clears throat> well, they said, we need to prioritize some safety critical processes because it's clear that some things were not, routine care was not being done properly, even though there were enough staff and there were enough people to do it. So these are the examples they decided that they would work on, the assessment of, assessment of information when the baby was admitted, 
cleaning and disinfection. You remember the weighing scales, cleaning the incubators, vital signs being done very unreliably. So these are targets for saying, these are the critical processes we're not doing, and these would make a great deal, a great difference to the routine care of babies. So this is the sort of first area of um, the first strat safety strategy, if you like, the best practice one. In the second one, improving the system. Well, obviously, one would like to have more technology and lots more equipment and so on. And in the long term, this is very, very critical, clearly. <clears throat> Nevertheless, there are things you can do about the way the care is organized, even now. Whiteboards, often it's just the, um, it's extraordinary that there aren't, there's nowhere in the ward you can go to see who is in charge of which baby, which tasks need doing. And say I've met a lot of emergency departments I've worked in in the US or in the, been to in the UK, they have a whiteboard showing who, what, you know, all the, all the patients or all the babies in the department and what their priorities are, what needs doing for them. So you can go and see the whole unit at a glance. Who is responsible for which task? This also would need to be clarified. They have medical and nursing handovers separately. So a lot of information goes missing. This is something that could change as well. And I mean, your country, it may be very, very different. You may have sorted all these things out. There may be other types of things. This is not for everywhere. This is an example of the sort of things one can do in, in any environment. Now, the third one, risk control. You may, again, you may think, well, there's so many risks, you know, what's, how can you control any of them? But this is a good example. In some units in Kenya, um, a babies can have continuous positive airway pressure. And this is very much recommended in international guidelines uh, when a sick baby with severe respiratory distress. And many of the units have the facilities to do this. The problem is, and I'm not speaking as expert here, I'm just relaying what I've learned, <clears throat> that you need to follow this up, you need to monitor it uh, for several days, you have to have a doctor who's familiar with it, you need the sufficient nurses to actually monitor it, um, ideally at two hourly intervals, otherwise it is dangerous. And yet there are many examples of this being given, very well intentioned, given in order to help the baby, but actually doing harm. So risk control would be decide when it is safe and when it is not safe to give this procedure or indeed any other kind of procedure where the benefits and the risks are finely balanced. And this could be agreed by local teams. You know, we only give this when we have the conditions in place, when we're sure we've got the staff to follow it up. So this is an example of an approach this controlling risks and trying to think ahead and set limits on care which sounds like you know, you're withholding care, but actually you're protecting the patients by introducing these approaches. The fourth approach, if you remember, is detecting and responding to hazards. And again, we found in Kenya, or Mike has found in Kenya, that everybody is constantly busy, of course, because there's impossible amount to do. But actually, because of this, they never stop and they don't gather together, information is lost, people being aware of babies becoming more sick or things happening or equipment problems, whatever, the information is not shared. And in military settings or many other settings, even in times of intense pressure, those are the times to gather together in simple huddles and introduce regular short meetings to check on things. And also for people to speak up and say when they're worried and when they have problems and so on. So this is another example of a, a fourth approach that is, is possible. So I won't do mitigation here. I think that we've, it seems we won't go into that in this particular context. But um, I hope that has given you rather quickly a run through <clears throat> of how safety strategies can be used in many, many different environments. And as I just rehearse. We have the ideas of system diagnosis to start with, that the basic idea of that is to make 
an assessment of the strengths and the vulnerabilities in the organization or your unit, your ward, your hospital. You can do this with observations, actually watching the care, which actually clinicians very seldom do. They're normally doing it. They don't stand back and watch. Interviews, get the people together to reflect, using standard techniques like process mapping, <clears throat> incident analysis. All of this helps to produce the sort of picture, as I said. And then you can use the portfolio approach to, to take, to mix different types of interventions. As I said, the safety critical processes, the best practice, um, improving the wider organization of care, risk control, enhancing response to hazards and mitigation. And I hope to have persuaded you that these sort of, that broad way of thinking is useful in many, many different contexts um, in healthcare. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, it's still. A wonderful presentation, Dr. Charles. And now I am taking one question. Uh, Dr. Sauro Mathi, he is writing, how can we mitigate the risk arising out of structural constraint of buildings, like slippery floors, wet floors in bathroom, etc.? Is there any validated and structured tool to address this issue? I'm afraid, I think the honest answer is I don't know. I think it'd be better to um, talk to an architect rather than a psychology professor. <laughs> um, but there are... Um, there is certainly a literature on the importance of design in safety um, more broadly. Um, the particular problems of slippery floors and things, I'm afraid I can't really help you with. So, so there is no, not a structure tool is right now available, we should say. Yeah. Well, so. it, it probably is available, but I, I can't, don't know about it myself. Okay. So thank you so much. And uh, one more question, I am some AQ Hirata is writing, as you commented that there is not enough number of experts on quality improvement and risk management. How should we make more experts in healthcare field? More collaboration with other industries, more education in medical or public nursing schools. I would happy if you give us your thought. Yes, I think that's very important. And, um... I think the first thing is not to feel, not to be afraid of it um, and not to think it's a sort of special thing that you have to go and learn, um, you know, in aviation or in the nuclear industry or something. We know a lot in healthcare now and our problem is not so much that we don't understand the problems or we don't have ideas about what to do about it, but we don't spend enough time thinking about how to improve the whole system as opposed to, you know, treating the patients. I would certainly like to see um, courses like you are doing. I've seen your course. It looks great. Much more widely in nursing education, in medical education. I would like, I think it would be very reasonable for um, medical staff, clinic nursing staff in hospitals to do short courses on these particular topics. I think the ideas we've deliberately, Mike and I and our Kenyan colleagues, we deliberately try to look at techniques which are fairly straightforward to understand, but, but more importantly, don't require a lot of money. And I think there's plenty of things out there which are extremely useful. And the biggest thing is to, is to get people to sometimes switch from thinking about one patient to thinking about the whole system. And that's sometimes quite difficult for people to do. But once they start, once they start thinking about how can I diagnose this ward or this hospital or this unit, then they suddenly they can become very enthusiastic very quickly. So I'm probably a rather rambling answer, but um, I'm very supportive of what you say. Sure. So... There is one more question for you. Dr. Soman Mukherjee is asking, how to make the end user more aware regarding the quality healthcare systems? The end user being the patients and the families. Is that, I suppose that means. Yeah, end user means uh, patient and families, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> I know sometimes in 
I can't speak in for your country um, where you're from, but um, in England, people sometimes say, well, you know, we must be very careful about this because we don't want to frighten the patients or we don't want to worry people. And even now I hear this, but actually as patients, we already know. If you talk to anyone who goes into hospital, they say things in England like, oh, the nurses were so busy, I didn't like to ask them, but I knew there were things, something had gone wrong, but they were too busy to ask. Um, you know, I can't get to see my primary care doctor. If you talk to people you meet, if I tell them I work in safety and healthcare, they say, oh, let me tell you what happened to my cousin or something like that. So we worry too much about telling people. I think we all, patients and families already know. And I think what's much more important is to enlist their help in saying, you know, you must always say, if you think something's wrong, you must speak up, you must tell me, and to make them partners and also partners in redesigning the system. So if you're in a Kenyan neonatal unit, then the mothers can help you. The mothers can help you redesign the system. It's not all the professionals, but this is a big topic. So I think we probably don't have time to go into it more than that. I think, uh, I think I am taking last question for you. That is Venus's Murumi. Uh, she is asking that how can we cope with cases of mistaken patients in surgical rooms where a patient is wrongly or mistakenly operated? So this is to prevent it or afterwards? Well, prevention, I guess you're mainly thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, I'm sure, will know better than me what procedures you have in place. So I would just say this, that sometimes people think about this by examining the incidents themselves that have happened and say, well, how can we prevent this incident? Now, that's useful, as I said, because it is gives you a window onto the system. But if I was looking at this, I would be looking very carefully at the whole process and I'd be thinking what checks are in place, who is doing the checks, is it always clear who is meant to be checking, I would be doing a process map of all the checks and seeing where the weak spots were and where things were being missed. The other thing I would do, because if you say to people are you doing the checks, they say oh yes, yes of course and they mean to, it's sincere is to go and watch. If you go and watch what happens, you will find things are not being done. And often for good reason, because they're busy, they're distracted. It's not because people don't care, but actually observing the processes is the best thing if you can do that. That's my suggestion, but I'm afraid, obviously, I don't know your particular situation. So thank you, Dr. Charles. And uh, you have given a very real example of that colposcope in operation theater. Actually, it happens last moment we are searching for some instrument and that is not available at that, especially at that time when you need it. So uh, with these words and your presentation is really wonderful. And uh, yeah, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Charles Vincent. As um, we want to honor you with a very, um, you know, I honestly, we would like to have you with us in India to present in our upcoming Kahokon. But at this point in time, we will honor you with a certificate. And I request Dr. Anuradha, the chairperson of our quality professionals wing to do the honors. Over to you, Dr. Anuradha. Uh, thank you, Lalu. Good evening to you all. Uh, it was uh, great listening to the way you have uh, prioritized the improving of quality and safety. Uh, sir, even in the resource challenge settings. And uh, again, as you told, the four uh, portfolio approaches would be very useful to our country also. And on behalf of CAHO, I am very honored to present you with the certificate of appreciation and I request you to accept it. Uh, the certificate will be sent to you by mail later. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to present and I'm glad it all worked out in spite of the technology and an honor to present with CAHO, CAHO, and to uh, talk to people in so many countries. It was wonderful. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you Dr. Charles Vincent.
thank you madam upasana arora for that wonderful moderation and uh, brilliant presentation dr charles uh, i think uh, most of the comments have been that you know it's been excellent and i think you related to all the countries uh, it's sometimes uh, difficult to try and understand the western concept but here you've been very much in line with the thinking of the low and middle income countries and how to refine our systems how to look at it in a very beautiful manner you put it across to us and thank you very much for that thank you very much to all the participants for being here today from different countries thank you so much